This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Hey, aloha and welcome to the Think Tech Hawaii studios for another episode of Security Matters Hawaii. Today we've got a live guest, not a remote guest, which is really good. Brandon Lester is joining me. Uh, he's the uh, Vice President of Technology for... SRC Technologies. SRC Technologies, thank you. And um, I met Brandon at, at AFCEA, so we're going to talk about sort of some of the local groups and some of the things they're doing with technology. He's uh, showed up in Hawaii and, and engaged a lot of this community. And uh, we'll get into some of that, and I'm interested myself in some of the sort of workforce development aspects of this that he sees, uh, you know, from the experience he's had around the mainland and, and compared to what we got going on in Hawaii. So, Brandon, welcome. Thanks for coming in, man. Thanks Good for to having see me, you. Right on. Um, so give our audience a little bit, much as you care to share about your background, um, if you can, and uh, kind of get us up to, bring us up to the current days. Sure, yeah. Um, I have a, a background in mechanical engineering, actually. Oh, ah, right on. Uh, Came out of University of Maryland, lived in Maryland pretty much my whole life. Uh, my wife and I met there, and then we ended up living in Germany for a few years. Ah. Came back to Maryland and ended up jumping over to the IT sector about 10 years ago. So I've spent uh, the better part of the past 10 years doing a lot of sysadmin work, information technology, you know, information assurance, that whole world of things. Wow. Um, joined SRC Technologies about six years ago and have really, really enjoyed my time working with small businesses and opportunities to always learn new technology, which is kind of where, you know, where the whole world is nowadays. Yeah, it's that nothing stops. Why well, you picked up some certs along the way. So did you do the PMP as a ME or did you do that later on in IT? I did it in IT actually. Okay. So I've always had a, an interest in the, the program side of the world, understanding how the way to get projects done. <laughs> Uh, you know, the, the whole... I'm only good at starting them, so I, I understand. I, we need people that can finish, trust me. Sure, yeah, I think there's there's a lot to be said for understanding the technology and the program and being able to bring it together. Mm, it's, it's not often where you can kind of live in both sides of the house, so that's really where I pride taking time and effort is learning how to do that kind of work. That's awesome. And I, you also have a CISSP, so which, which came first? CISSP came first. Okay. A lot of times, you know, you get onto a new option, opportunity and the contract says, hey, go out and check out this cert. So I started cool. as, I, I started as a mechanical engineer, jumped into IT to see what it was like. Okay, wow. Spent some time, got Windows certs first. Started that job, found out, had nothing to do with Windows. <laughs> <laughs> Looked into what the next thing was, learned how to do sysadmin on whatever systems were out there, a lot of time on Red Hat systems. Oh, ah, okay. So right. went out and got a Red Hat cert. A couple years later, decided, Time to take another level. I think uh, the government regulations said you had to go get Security Plus, Security Plus, and then onward and upward, yeah. CSSP. But I really do enjoy learning new technology, take, taking the time to go find what, uh, what certification can help back that up. So since the uh, CSSP and PMP, I've spent a lot of time in the cloud stuff, ah, right um, Google Cloud certs, Amazon Web Services certs. Uh, it's, it's so different. Mm -hmm. It's it's a night and day technology jump, and it's, is that right? It's really exciting, I think, to see the the opportunities that what used to be take a piece of hardware, throw it in a rack, go find your your disk, and then Pixie Boot or whatever's going on. Nowadays, it is click click click, and you are up and running. Wow, in it's, the cloud, just yeah, I, I do. I saw you can purchase images like, and they're already um, they're certified images like from CSC and things like that. Yeah. Of, of all types of builds, and it's amazing you can just load those images and be up and running, Absolutely. and have some security sort of baked in. I guess you got to still configure it, but sure. um, it's got some standards there. So tell, give me a little bit of um, since you since you've been looking at cloud, because I'm interested in that, because um, I know a lot of the sort of development these days is is headed that direction. Mm -hmm. Are pure software developers that are writing software, let's say for example, from you know my world, the, the physical security industry, maybe a, an access control software that you're going to run on a a Windows server um, versus a, some cloud-based software that you're going to run, which is, I, I see terms like containers and Kubernetes and these types of things. So sure. give us a, what's the what's the advantages, I guess? Can you give me the pros and cons of both or something? As a, yeah, absolutely. Thanks. So from a software development perspective, I think there's a lot of times where you've got um, people just coding on their system locally, and then you're going to you know put that into some sort of code repository, get whatever you're using in your office, and Ultimately, where things have changed is the deployment of that software. I see. So the process of coding is, is not a lot different, although there are many, many new tools and tricks, right? Sure. But the process of deploying that software went from 
you know, let's come up with some new ideas, new releases. We'll plan a quarterly release. Oh, yeah, two Is builds it, a year. Mm -hmm. or Yeah, I understand. Mm -hmm. Okay, gotcha. Modern day software companies are deploying 700 times a day. <laughs> it never it is, ceases. And it's continuous. Wow, that's and awesome. And so now that's, that's a new uh, mantra, continuous integration, continuous delivery. Wow. And you really don't even think about the deployment at that point, which is really, huh. really the, the goal of it. You've got code, sure. you commit it, you get it in, into your system, and it's up. Yeah, if you, you have a problem, sort of you a back it out. It's a living tool. It uh, is, a, yeah. a living build that is as dynamic. I mean, do, so is it, is it looking at user input even, or user UI like experience reporting, saying, ooh, we need, we, this needs to be quicker, or I mean, is it that dynamic? It, it is, um, it's to the point where, you know, we've got whole teams of people coding wherever they are, whatever software they're using. And Netflix is a good example of leading that charge okay. where they're deploying many, many, many times a day. Wow. Um, it, it kind of removes the need to worry about what kind of changes you're making as long as you're, you know, following the, the best practices of your company and your mm -hmm. organization. You get that code up and live, whether it's in a, a develop it's development scenario or A-B testing where you've got some customers seeing one thing, other customers seeing another oh, thing, and, and wow. you decide how that works. Wow, interesting. Is the, uh, so is the containerization in these things, I hear micro container, I hear mm -hmm. uh, like you can bring your own container on-prem even and all this kind of stuff. Sure. Is this, is that, is there more portability in this design um, architecture? Is that, is that why this is so um, advantageous, I guess, is the word? There's definitely more portability. It's also much easier to ramp up, ramp down, recover. Wow. And that's really the goal, I think, is going back about I think five or ten years now, the concept of development and operations were this far apart. Okay. Someone came out with an idea, let's start bringing that together. And there's, there's a new term, right? DevOps. And that, that mantra is, let's have both groups work together and let's build our processes so that can happen. And the DevOps world means you can deploy, the code goes into your repository, you've got automation on the back end that says, create a build, release the build put the build in production, you don't have sysadmins doing that work anymore. <laughs> that is completely wow. Wow. automated, awesome. and it's a pipeline now. Wow. So that whole premise kind of got people thinking in a new way, and that's where something like containers came out of, because when you start up your Gmail, when you start up any SaaS kind of application, okay. a software application that you're running on the web, usually the back end of that system is going to spin up a container just for you and you've got your own little mini micro VM there. Okay. And that is the container that says, here's how Andrew's gonna run all of, his, all of his stuff. You're done, you blow the container away, it's gone, it's right? It's dead. The resources are, are back where they were. Mm -hmm. And that's why you've got so many uh, really easy cloud deployments now, because okay. you can scale up and scale down very fast just by systems, whether that's an AWS, you know, Elastic Cloud instance, or something like a Kubernetes, uh, it's, it's really the orchestration of those containers. Okay, I so, see. So the terms start to mingle and you, mm -hmm. you don't really know. Okay. Yeah, I, I read about it, but I don't, I don't understand. I don't do it, so I don't, know, I don't right. understand where, where they sort of work together. Absolutely, yeah. The, the container systems, um, one of the big ones a few years ago was Docker, and that's sure. still a big format. Uh, but Kubernetes is really the, the ability to just take Docker to the nth degree and mm. automate how you're going to spin those things up and down as you need to. Wow. Yeah, so there's a group that I actually had on this show called Arculis uh, from my industry that's mm -hmm. all Google Kubernetes mm -hmm. containers. Uh, they have video access control and even some audio now integrated all in that platform. And they're doing this, and it was blowing my mind how quickly they, it's like you mention a feature and it's there. Like it, yeah. it goes from ideation to application mm -hmm. instantly. And I was like, wow, this is amazing because my industry is archaic com sure, yeah. comparatively speaking, right. you know. And, so I, I, I don't know where these guys are going to go with their product, but I, I do wish them well. They're funded out of uh, Canon is, a, is a, they're, oh, okay. they're back in. So looking for big things out of them. So let's um, let's kick a little bit into the workforce. So you've, um, you're have you a bit of a hybrid coming from the ME space mm -hmm. into the IT space. Um, where do you see the greatest sort of need out there now? If you're looking at the kind of work that you're doing, that you're aware of people are doing, and uh, the youth that are programming, are they, you think, are they... You know, I had COBOL and Fortran, right? So they're not doing that kind of garbage. Are they learning uh, different types of code for cloud applications? Is that 
the future? Is it mobile? Like, or are these the same things? Or yeah, the the coding languages out there don't need to be particular to a specific space anymore. Okay. Um, you, you do see some differentiation when you're trying to optimize for mobile. Okay. You know, if you're writing for something like iOS or Android, sure, you're going to have have to live in that different marketplace for very obvious reasons, right? You're trying to optimize. You're trying to figure out how to to write the best uh, best product in that space. Sure. But in the in the cloud world, I'd say it's still pretty wide open. Okay. You know, you've got a lot of folks that either live in Java, JavaScript space, or shifting over, depending on your application, a lot of machine learning and, and artificial intelligence work mm -hmm. is done in either Python, because it's got so many libraries to go with it, or okay. um, you know that's the data science half, where people are writing code in TensorFlow, or, or people actually doing machine learning in some of these other open source products that wow. people like Google or Facebook or whomever are putting out. I see. And is this is that where the sort of the the, the in a university system like in the UH system or in Maryland where you went mm -hmm. was this? I guess you went for ME, but is are they teaching that stuff, or is it still you got to learn the whole back end to understand where it fits, and then TensorFlow, for example, becomes a bit of your specialty or your language of choice or whatever it may be. I think it's a little bit of everything. Okay. I think you know, you're going to have you're going to have classes that specialize in you know let's learn Java 101. Okay. But if you want to get into the meat and potatoes of a specific instance or application where you want to learn how to use specific tools, uh, you're going to probably spend time on a project doing something like gotcha. that. Gotcha. So. You know, depending on how the, the school structures the class, obviously you're going to do some coding while you're there, probably have a end of the year project. So there are always options to go out and say, I want to learn this component or this library even. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a, a language like Python is so big that there's lots and lots of opportunities to say, I want to learn here, or I want to learn here, and then you could spend another month just working on that section of, of the code. Wow. And are these deployment teams, is this project based do they teach that in school I mean you have that you have that PMP perspective sure. on sort of like software development or application development or whatever you would call it mm -hmm. I guess do you still call it software development or is it yeah. just DevOps like is it uh, it's software dev yeah okay. yeah and even in the world of software development you've got different categories right I have a lot of experience in analytics development okay if you're doing an analytic you're gonna write that somewhere usually that somewhere is gonna be a cloud so you sure. have to be uh, familiar with what you're doing in the in the cloud, whether it's you know the administrative side or the DevOps side, just to have that code work properly, right? Um, if you're going to take those analytics and you want to put them on a dashboard, you've got to have some UI developers experience on that stack, okay. and those always have gray areas where you're kind of going between. You know, you can have a a full stack engineer, and that's kind of considered the the unicorn of the space where ah. <laughs> they know everything about everything, right? <laughs> And whether that's a, a person that you get, whether you're lucky enough to have someone like that, uh, nine times out of ten, I think, even if you have a few, you're going to want them to diversify sure. and, and focus on a certain component anyway. So there's so many pieces to, to a full product nowadays that I think you really end up having to have different teams and that project mentality. Mm. Uh, go out, let's do this piece of the, the work, and then bring it back together. Awesome. I think it's amazing that... Uh, Myself, I'm sure most of our viewers don't really appreciate how much work goes into that experience that they have on that mobile device or on that page or in that app. You know, there's it's all been planned, it's all been designed. There's a there's a reason, and in fact, they're learning from you while you're using it how to improve it and make it better. Mm -hmm. Which is, a, I think, a, a, that it's not like the noema and the noesis and this this whole noetic pole of uh, of uh, what's it called? Um, uh, forget the words now. But how this cre where things are created instantly, mm -hmm. but it is getting closer and closer to that. Yeah, it really is. Um, and, and we're going to get to a point where people are going to be worried about you know machine learning and the code writing itself for us. We're actually at a, a point now where you can probably teach a machine based off of good examples of code to get you most of the way there. Oh, wow. But a lot of the work done there is now going to be a focus on how do I help the people that are doing their jobs now mm -hmm. do it better, smarter, faster. I right? see. There's, there's always the fear of, you know, when are the machines going to take over? <laughs> or, or who's going to steal my job? It's going to be this kind of computer. It's, it's never going to get to a point where you don't want a human involved. Sure. The, the best scenario is we're all doing 10 times the amount of work we are today 
in 10 years from now yeah. because we've all got those toolkits where it gets you past all the, the hard stuff. And right now, most of the focus is on how do you replace the tedious work. I see. But as we mature and go down that path, it should be you know, more and more efficient. We don't, have a, we don't have a scenario where you're spending all day doing code cleanup, right? Yeah. Something should, should be able to do that for you. Wow. There may be hope for me yet. We're going to take a quick break. Uh, we'll be back in about one minute after we pay a couple of bills. Thanks for joining. Hi, I'm Lisa Kimura. I'm the host of Family Affairs on Think Tech Hawaii. Join us every Tuesday at 11 a.m. to talk about the issues that really matter. Everything from policies that need to be changed in Hawaii to the fact that we need better gender equality so that we can all have a better shot. Again, join us every Tuesday at 11 on Think Tech Hawaii for Family Affairs. Aloha. Aloha, I am Howard Wig. I am the proud host of Code Green for Think Tech Hawaii. I appear every other Monday at 3, and I have really, really exciting guests on the exciting topic of energy efficiency. Hope to see you there. Hey, welcome back to this episode of Security Matters Hawaii. We've been drilling down into what's going on out there in the world of, 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 of IT and high tech, and it's kind of become this cloud, instantaneous sort of, uh, of UI design and development uh, where the consumers are, I think, driving the business decisions that are being made. You know, they're, they're really trying to appeal to you. And uh, Brandon's given us some real insight on some of how that's getting done and why it's, it's so um, uh, uh, getting simpler, I guess is the word. So the workforce in Hawaii, and you've been out here now a, a few years? Just under a year, actually. Just under a year, mm -hmm. okay. So the workforce that you've seen, and we'll get into some of these folks. I know you're a member of FCIA, which mm -hmm. is our Armed Forces uh, Communication Electronics Association. I've seen you at uh, HICTA, the Hawaii Information Communication Technology Association. Uh, we have a group at UH under Scheidler under the ITMA, which yep. is our... Information Technology Management Association. Yep. <laughs> we've yeah, got, something like that. We've got a lot of groups, and there's a, so there's a lot of input for the the kids that are learning and wanting to learn um you know in in your experiences you've been you know from the mainland and here what do you see in the kids here we got the we got talent we have a reason to keep them here i mean what do we got going on yeah there's really really good talent out here awesome uh, i've been really you know pleasantly it. surprised to show up and see what an active community the folks are doing here in hawaii and ah. that's that's from middle school, high school, and into the colleges. Awesome. Um, there's a really good program out there called Cyber Patriot yep. that folks here do very well in. And, and part of that is the locality of all the different expertises here on island. You, know, you have a lot of DOD presence that gives, mm -hmm. gives those folks an opportunity to go out and spend time with students. Uh, but it really, really helps when kids have opportunity, right? Yeah. Yeah, cyber, so Cyber Patriot's been around for a little while, and I know, um, I mean, the uh, NSA has done a, f a fantastic job here. I think they've got a program running with some, some instructors at, like, even Lelehua High School. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they've gone down below that level yet, but, um, and then our UH program, we've got kids that have gone on. They've interned up there and then gone up to the NSA CSS here, so, and into other, um, I think we have a pretty reasonable um, Air Force and Army intel community out here yeah. as well, so there's, you know, Absolutely. there's guys that are getting in there out of our schools, but... We don't want them all in there now. They, they need the great ones. Sure. So below that, we need them in industry, you know, right. for, for, to, for low voltage technicians, right? We, need, we have some technology. I think my guys go up to like Security Plus or sort of the highest level mm -hmm. assurance um, that my, t my team has. Okay. Um, and so, you know, we do have a path uh, to, for training folks in, in low voltage industries. And it's starting to bleed into AV systems. You know, they're hacking phone systems now. They're, people are trying to get into any system. They can find a way into your, into your um, supply chain, you know, and so... Mm -hmm. The deliverers of low voltage technology systems are a bit of a target there, um, so we do need to have a, a security mindedness about our, about our industry. Um, where do, where do you think they can go if they're not a not a stellar? You know, if this programming world, if the if they're not NSA material, what what uh, what do you what do you think they can look for in Hawaii? Is there, what do you see that they could be getting into? Because see if I could program anywhere, clouds Absolutely. anywhere, I can do it from here. So yeah, so uh, for uh, for lack of better references, I'll throw out a few different of the, you know, the modern sayings where big data or data is the new oil. Okay. Big well, what does that mean? Data is new oil. Love it. Data is new oil to me means any organization is going to care about their data and they're going to need to do something smart with it. Yep. There's also the, the saying nowadays, software is eating the world. Yeah. 
right? So I've seen it. <laughs> software is everywhere. And that ties right into the data components, right? So if you can take a new mentality, no matter what industry you're in, no matter what vertical in that industry you're in, and see that there's value in software and there's value in data, you can embrace that. Okay. But the cybersecurity part of it is really the pervasive need to be able to defend all of that work that you're doing, yeah. right? And, yeah, and keep somebody from taking it or taking the data or whatever it may be. Absolutely. Building, building with security in mind, you know, security, uh, by design, you might say, which my industry left out, by the way. We built a ton of software and cameras and access control systems, and they had no security baked in whatsoever. So my industry is going under a correction now, which it's taken NIST to come in and UL sure. to come in because the manufacturers didn't want to do it on their own. Um, in this application world that a lot of the consumers and, and business people are dealing with, um, are do, what's your feeling? Is that stuff being done better? You know, when it lives in the cloud, is the security... Uh, implicit? Uh, the mindset is changing. Okay. But I don't think we're there yet. Okay. Even in that container world we were talking about earlier, um, I think it's kind of magical to some people that it works, but there's always something that's going to happen. Something is going to go wrong. So there was a, there was a pretty significant container um, vulnerability not that long ago. And those are going to continue to happen because sure. it is still just software. Yeah. And you're always going to have vulnerabilities no matter where you're looking. Uh, I think the key is really to stay as up to speed as we can, and it's really challenging to be able to, to go deep down into your project and code and stay there, develop really good things, but also be completely aware of what's happening over here with mm. vulnerabilities or the latest type of attack on the cybersecurity front. And that's why the, the industry uh, sees itself as really far behind on the, on the staffing part of it. I see. Because no matter whether we were able to go out and train a million new cybersecurity experts today, they're not only going to have to come up to speed on whatever systems they're protecting, so you have to have some domain knowledge there, but also you have to keep up with the latest pace and latest trends. And there's, mm. there's some pretty good podcasts and blogs and all kinds of ways to consume that information, but it really takes time and effort. Ah, so training. I argue, don't argue, I shouldn't say argue. I, I've been talking with my, our teams, for example, about time budget. You know, you, you've got to build in time budget, and it's sort of a business expense, right? It's a cost of business to do this training that's so necessary. And I'm just going to guess that the closer you are to the leading edge of technology development, the more training you probably have to do. It's got to be constant. Um, off the top of your head, what would you say? Four hours a week? A couple hours a day? What do you think people need to be doing, you know, to keep, their, to keep up with what's going on in this world of technology development? The, the world of technology development doesn't really matter what technologies you're using. You're always going to have to stay abreast of what's happening in mm. that particular space. Yeah. And it really depends on how fast the, the industry itself is changing. So mm -hmm. it is inherently part of your job now. It's not one of those things where to you... To learn. To learn, yeah. yeah. It's not one of those things where you break away and I'm going to go take, you know, a Windows class. I'm not going to go take a VMware class, et cetera, et cetera. It, it is really a scenario in which if I'm writing code in a specific language, I'm referring to those docs all day long. If mm -hmm. I get to a library I haven't used before, I'm looking at it to find out how I'm supposed to be using this mm -hmm. and the calls and all those kinds of things. So it really turns into an opportunity where you have to bake it into your process. Wow. Are, are, do you, so do you think people, let me ask you a question, how much mobility does a person have if they've gone down a path for developing, let's just say something, uh, an app for a mobile, uh, an iOS device? Mm -hmm. Can they then jump into uh, some, uh, uh, some uh, perhaps let's say Google Cloud development of another app of some other type? Is that, is it, are, are these skills fairly transportable across the domains, I guess, there? If, if those are really different domains, maybe yeah, they're not? Yeah, I, I think they really are transferable. Okay. Uh, not just the the tools where you kind of know how to code in one language, you're probably going to be okay jumping to another one as long as you get the, you know, the, the little tweaks and the mindsets differently. Okay. Uh, the, the back end, the cloud type of stuff, is far more accessible than it's ever been. Yeah, I see. So to, to go out and learn how to use any of these cloud opportunities is really uh, just a matter of finding the right application to do it in. Awesome. So I want to go out and I want to build a new project. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go spin some some servers up, and there's certainly a lot of time and effort you can go to learning the back end of the architecture, and you have to understand a lot of that to do security right. Okay. But you have opportunities to say, all right, I have my architecture team, I have my DevOps team, now I have the platform I need. And 
if I'm going to write some code, I can live over here, and it's very easy to use and deploy. Wow. And so, in Honolulu, if you want to meet some of these bright brains and find out what some of the ideas are that are going on, uh, this week, tomorrow night, there's going to be an event, uh, Wetware Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about that. I know you've, I think you've driven some of that or attended some of those. Sure. Tell me a little bit about that, uh, that, uh, that group. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump around a little bit. Wetware okay. Wednesday, tomorrow night, is um, traditionally a software developers networking social. Yep. And they have them every month, always the last Wednesday of the month. And traditionally what, um, what the team does is they bring in what we consider kind of a, a sponsor that's going to you know, pay for the, the food and bring in some new ideas and some new flavors. So okay. this month, that's AFSEA. So that's my yes. tie-in. Awesome, okay. Young AFSEAs is uh, basically anyone in AFSEA that's part of the community under 40 and really has a, a unique set of careabouts within the AFSEA community. Mm -hmm. What we have done is tried to partner with many of the organizations on the island to do these kind of joint events where I want to bring the FCA community to the software development community. What we're Wednesday is the sure. perfect opportunity to do that. So tomorrow night, we're going to be talking about what Young FC is doing a little bit later this year, all of our different events, whether it's mentoring or tech talks or other opportunities that we've got going on, and uh, basically have an opportunity to announce that to a community we don't usually get to, to work with. That's awesome. And they're going to be at Aloha Brewing? Aloha in, Beer. Yep. Aloha Beer down yep. in Kaka'ako. So come on out there tomorrow night. You know, if you're, if you're looking for some young talent in the IT space, there's a lot of those folks working there. If you want to do some mentorship and help some of these folks understand the needs of a business community, uh, go down there and meet with them. Um, the, the young FCNs will be there. They are an under 40 group, who award-winning under 40 group, by the way, a national award. You yeah, we, we have some really good folks in the organization that, that are able to go out and, and do some good things. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Really, I mean, that's really important. So uh, get on down there. Check out Wet Wear Wednesday tomorrow night in Kaka'ako. At what time? 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock, 6 till 8 or 9, something yeah. like that. Be yep. down there. So come on out. Um, let's, if we don't work on workforce development together, we're not going to develop a workforce that stays in Hawaii. And I think there's a lot of momentum and a lot of capacity here for us to do that. So come on out. We'll see you down there uh, because security matters. Aloha.